All right, I'd like us, if we could, to turn in our Bibles to the book of Isaiah the prophet and the sixth chapter, very well-known chapter. We're going to read the first eight verses. Um, we will explain the reasoning behind reading them uh, shortly, uh, but let's just begin with Isaiah chapter 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. From mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And then said I, Here am I, send me. And again, God will bless that short reading from his precious word uh, to us this evening. I want to talk about uh, this evening the Welsh Revival, but it's not the Welsh Revival that you would be familiar with. It happened at the same time, the same year, 1904, but this occurred in North Wales, not in South Wales, where the one that uh, we know so well about Evan Roberts took place. But this is in the north of the Principality of Wales. Now, Wales, just to give you an idea geographically, um, Wales would fit on Vancouver Island for you Canadians, just so you know, size-wise, what we're talking about. And it, for the Americans here, it's the same size as the state of Louisiana. So it's a country, but it's not a very big country. And to go from today, if you were down in South Wales, say down in Cardiff or Swansea, and you drove up to North Wales to Wrexham, it would be about a three-hour drive. But back in 1904, uh, travel was a lot less uh, convenient, and uh, the two sides of the of the country uh, was separated not just by a mountain range and all kinds of other difficulties, but also uh, separated by language. And one of the reasons we don't know much about the no North Wales revival is because it occurred in Welsh-speaking chapels and churches. And uh, so it's only in recent years, actually 2010, uh, that uh, a book has been written where translations of the accounts of the events from the Welsh have been translated into English. And this is this is the book. I just laid up there. I'll tell you what it's called in a minute. But um, it's when God uh, came to North Wales, an ac account of how the 1904-05 religious revival affected the uh, the Welsh the the Welsh speaking churches in North Wales. So as we consider uh, this revival in North Wales, we said it's lesser known because again it wasn't until recent years that it was translated into a language that we could understand. I want to give you a definition of, of how they understood revival from the book, and I think it's a very helpful definition. Uh, it says this, we mean not only a bringing back of vitality and fervor to the churches, and by the way, that's one thing we long for, right, is to bring back vitality and fervor to, the church, to our churches, to our assemblies, we want to see complacency, uh, kind of medio mediocrity swept away, and a new uh, fervor and vitality in the church. He says, but it's not only that. It's whole districts being subdued by the presence of God. Isn't that amazing? Whole districts being subdued by the presence of God. In revival, the religious and the irreligious, Christian and non-Christian, are humbled by the awesome presence of the living and eternal God. And that's certainly what occurred 
in North Wales. So there was a, a little foreshadowing, a precursor to the revival that occurred in the summer of 1904 uh, in an area uh, in that region. Uh, there was a, a Welsh Baptist chapel called Sion or Zion, uh, but in the Welsh Sion, a Welsh Baptist chapel in Ponkey. And they had a couple of months, June, July, 1904, where it seems that the church there came under powerful influences of the Holy Spirit. One newspaper reporter describing described it as the Ponky Pentecost. He said older members, some of them who had witnessed the 1859 revival, said they had never experienced such manifestations of God's glory before. So even exceeding the 59 revival, the manifestations of the presence of God and his glory. Over 20 people were saved in this little chapel and saints were revived. And so that was kind of a precursor of what was about to come. But God's initial instrument in the revival that would break out in November of 1904 was a disillusioned preacher. His name was Reese Bevan Jones. He was 35 years of age. He was very well respected uh, as a pastor in South Wales, a Baptist pastor in South Wales, but he had become very dissatisfied with the poor state of his own spiritual life. He felt a kind of emptiness and coldness in his sermons. And I just want to pause there and say this, that part of the reason why many of us come together to pray is that we feel a lack in our ministry. We, we feel a lack of the power of God in our preaching and long for that. And so here he is, he's 35 years of age. He's very well respected. He's uh, pastoring one of the biggest Baptist churches in South Wales, but he feels like he's, there's a lack. There's a great lack here. He'd been saved at the age of 12. He lacked assurance. His father was a godly deacon in a Welsh Baptist church, uh, but he lacked assurance. Like many uh, people saved at a young age, the struggle of assurance was a real struggle with him. Uh, and uh, then as well as that, uh, he longed for closer communion with God. And so here he is just longing, yearning for something more. And he came under the influence of the deeper life movement and the teachings of the Keswick Convention. Uh, in fact, in, in 1903, uh, F.B. Mayer uh, held a, a Welsh Keswick for the deepening of the Christian life. And he, like many others in Wales, hungered for a deeper uh, Christian experience. And so he, he went along and his desire was for the Holy Spirit to do a work in his life and to transform his ministry. And at that conference, he was encouraged to take hold of the Holy Spirit by faith. It resulted in a remarkable change in his life and ministry. The, up to this point, he'd been very influenced by the writings of the higher critics. Now, if you remember, uh, in Germany in the late 1800s, uh, the universities were leavened with this higher critical teaching where men sat in judgment on the word of God, and they were the modern day, as it were, Sadducees. But uh, they, they had a big effect in all the Bible colleges and all the seminaries. And so he had been influenced by that. And no wonder uh, he described his preaching as empty and cold, because it had been influenced by, by this unbelieving kind of mentality of the higher critics. And so all of this lost its appeal when he came into contact with the Keswick teaching. I want to just kind of set the Keswick teaching. We, we, we did a whole session on Keswick theology. But what Keswick offered was experiential Christianity rather than theoretical, that you can know victory in your Christian life, that you can know deliverance uh, from besetting sins, that you can know a life of joy and fullness in the Holy Spirit. And, and this set in contrast to the, the cold academic higher critical teaching that was just leavening not only the seminaries, but the churches, because the preachers are coming out of these seminaries affected by it, just like our friend R.B. Jones. And so after this experience at Keswick, 
where he really believed the spirit of God had he fully yielded his life. We could put it that way to the control and the power of the Holy Spirit. He stood before his congregation of admiring listeners. And he says, I have dedicated myself wholly to the service of Jesus, my Lord, and have received the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, which God gives, he said, to those that ask him. He soon became an effective evangelist, not just in the pulpit, but in the open air and in street work as well. There was a new note in his preaching, his calling his hearers to, to a life of holiness. And so that all kind of sets the scene for the revival in North Wales, because there was a Welsh chapel there called Penuel, or Peniel, we would say, Penwell Welsh Baptist Church, and they invited R.B. Jones for a series of meetings from the 8th to the 18th of November in 1904. Prayer meetings had been held a week prior to the visit. His messages were from Isaiah chapter 6, the passage we just read, and his themes were visions of God, the sense of sin. Remember Isaiah, uh, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. So, so the visions of God, the sense of sin, and the kingship of Christ coming into the presence of the one who indeed is the king of the ages. One of the listeners at that time was a young lad. He later went on to be a principal in a grammar school in the area. But this is what he said. He said he made holiness real. He, he made holiness terrible. How can I describe it at all? I it was a consuming fire. R.B. Jones himself was a consuming fire, and so was his message. And the preacher's fire consumed the congregation. Isaiah's reaction to the holiness of God became the reaction of the entire congregation. They collectively said, woe is me for I am undone. And as a result of it, scores were deeply distressed over the poverty of their Christian lives and their indifference to the condition of the lost. Or oh, that somehow God would do something in our lives to make us realize and acknowledge the poverty of our Christian lives and our indifference to the condition of the lost. This continued night after night. By Sunday, the message was so greatly used of God, it was described in this way. It says that the Jew of heaven was upon the service. They had a youth meeting at 3.30 that afternoon. Young people flocked, not just from Peniel, but from all the surrounding chapels came because word got out of this empowered preaching that was taking place in the Baptist Chapel, and he spoke for 20 minutes that Sunday afternoon, 3.30 p.m., on the need of consecration, the need, Romans 12, of presenting these young people, their bodies, holy uh, to the Lord, and it set the youth on fire. Local newspaper reporter who was present described it this way, and this is amazing. A lot of this information in this book comes from the secular press. It's hard to imagine, but the, 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 there's a whole section, day-by-day day account of the revival given by the secular press. <laughs> Remarkable. Wouldn't it be amazing if the secular press were reporting on what was happening in our meetings and doing it in a positive way rather than a negative way? But this is what one of the reporters put. He said, the speaker appeared to be burned up with the intensity of his entreaty. And the Spirit's mighty working so affected me, this is the newspaper reporter, that I felt the seat was literally shaking where I sat. <laughs> this is a newspaper reporter. Can you imagine this? This is an amazing scene. The next day, a prayer meeting was called for at 2 p.m., followed by a procession through the town. And this was one of the things that marked the North Wales revival, that oftentimes they'd gather together for prayer, and then they would march right through the town, and they'd stop at all the public houses, all the, the pubs, and then they would preach. And so R.B. Jones preached outside of many of the public houses. The procession seemed to stir the place. 
and crowds gathered that night for the evening meeting at Penwell, even leaving the pubs empty. And there were eight conversions that night. Throughout, throughout the week, souls were saved night after night. And when the day of R.B. Jones's meetings came uh, to an end, uh, what they did is they decided they would have an all-day service, the last day, the Friday of his meetings. So they began with prayer in the morning. And what happened was uh, the minister of the church said this. He said it was the most remarkable meeting he had ever been in. He said, prayer and praise without intermission all day long and nobody getting tired. That sounds a little bit about what we've been hearing in Asbury. People praying, praising all day long. Nobody gets tired. And then he says, <clears throat> that night, the final meeting was held in Jerusalem Calvinistic Methodist Chapel. And the reason they moved it was because the Baptist church couldn't hold the crowds anymore. And so they had to move to the biggest church building in the community, which was the Calvinistic Methodist Chapel. And even that was not sufficient for the crowds. It was too small. Many could not get in. Jones preached his last message on Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Following the preaching, the meeting was left open and many testified to the saving grace of God and his reviving work in their lives. The following morning, a long procession accompanied R.B. Jones to the railway station. The preacher left, but the Holy Spirit did not leave. And the revival continued. And what's so remarkable is that uh, the crowds continued to flock into the churches. Now all of them opened for prayer meetings. Uh, some men even came out of the public houses at 11 p.m. after the pubs were shut, came to the chapel under the influence of drink, and they soon came under the influence of a more powerful spirit and were soundly converted. Homes were put right Marriages were restored. Families uh, where poverty had gripped them because of the abuse of drink uh, were now uh, having full tummies and enjoying uh, the comforts of a Christian home. During the weeks that followed, other preachers came as they were able to help out throughout the revival. R.B. Jones had lit the flame, but God, the Holy Spirit, continued to presence himself in the gatherings, in the saving of souls and reviving of saints. One man said the preaching of R.B. Jones, he said this, young as I was, I knew it was great preaching. What I heard at Peniel in November 1904 was not a theologian, but a flaming evangelist, passionate and consuming, seraphic, like the seraphim that we've just been reading about in Isaiah chapter 6. What the preacher dispensed to my soul, now listen carefully to this, what the preacher dispensed to my soul was not formulas, but life. Wow, isn't that challenging? What the preacher dispensed to my souls was not formula, but life. In that little community of Ross, 1,338 conversions occurred during the crusade, the revival. In a nearby district, another 233 were converted. Now, again, in these small communities, that number of converts literally transformed the whole atmosphere of the community. By April 1905, revival scenes were still continuing. It had spread throughout North Wales. Visitors, visitors had come from many countries to see what God was doing in North Wales and left with a sense of the presence of God and carried revival fires with them wherever they went. And a new sense of life and purpose and the presence of God was felt in all the churches in the area of North Wales. Ross now is part of what we call the city of Wrexham. Uh, the building still stands and the area desperately needs a fresh visitation like it experienced in 1904 but not just that area. All of our assemblies could do with a fresh infusion of Holy Spirit life. Our preaching could do with more of that energy of the Holy Spirit. 
and less of cleverness of man. And so a great revival had a great impact. Again, we all know about Evan Roberts and not that God didn't, God used that tremendously too. And isn't it interesting that the same year, completely independent of each other, Evan Roberts may well have been changing trains in Wrexham at some point during the revival, but he had no dealings with it whatsoever. This is God the Holy Spirit working in a different area at exactly the same time. And it's wonderful to see it. And that's why we're here. We're here because I hope like the the Christians in this area, we see. And like the the, the preacher, the Christians and the preacher, we see our need. There's a lack today. We need Holy Spirit revival. I need Holy Spirit revival. We desperately need God to move again. And maybe we're seeing something in Asbury. May it not stop in Asbury and spread throughout this needy continent and not stop here because there's another needy continent that we've been speaking about tonight called the British Isles and all of Western Europe, desperately dark, desperately in need of a move of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray with earnestness and urgency tonight that God might do it again. Amen.